Have you ever heard of a fecal microbiota transplant? It's when you transplant poop from one animal to another in order to transfer all of the gut bacteria, or microbiota. Poop transplants are a very powerful tool to study the emerging field of the microbiome. Science, so glamorous. Hey, welcome to Nourishable, I'm Dr. Lara. An adult human body is made up of approximately 37.2 trillion cells and 100 trillion microbes. If all of these cells were the 102 floors of the Empire State Building, you'd have to run up 73 flights of microbial stairs before getting to any human levels. By cell count, we're more microbe than human. But before you get totally grossed out, it turns out that these microbes are playing critical roles to help keep us healthy. But who are these microbes? And I can't see them, so where are they living? These microbes are mostly bacteria, but they also include some fungi, archaea, and viruses. Collectively, we call them the microbiome. These microbes live all over the body, in the mouth, armpit, nose, skin, vagina if you have one, and intestine. The microbiome is vastly different on different parts of the body. Microbes that love the warm darkness of the armpit are different from the acidic vagina or the anaerobic intestine. Poop is a rich source of gut microbes. How do we get our microbiome? As a fetus, we develop inside a somewhat sterile womb. Our microbiome is then seeded with the first microbes that we're exposed to. These can be our mother's vaginal microbes for vaginal births or skin microbes for C-section deliveries. Studies suggest that these first microbial introductions are important in the development of conditions like allergies and asthma. The microbiome continues to diversify depending on your exposures to become unique to you. Breastfed or formula fed? Siblings? Pets? farm or city, play in the dirt or a sterile bubble, but what are these microbes doing? Research is just starting to unwind the complex relationships between microbes and their human hosts. But here are five established functions of the microbiome that help keep us healthy. Microbes in our gut can synthesize vitamins, specifically vitamin K and several B vitamins, including folate, riboflavin, and vitamin B12. We have mutually symbiotic relationships with these vitamin synthesizing microbes. We give them food and a lovely anaerobic intestine to live in, and in return, we absorb their vitamin products to function in our body. Plant foods contain fibers that we don't have the enzymes to digest, but our microbes do. Just like yeast ferment malt to produce alcohol and carbon dioxide, the bacteria in our gut ferment fiber to produce gas and other nutrients. Yep, our farts come from bacterial fermentation. This underlies why germ-free mice are extra lean. Germ-free mice are totally sterile, with no microbiome at all. Since they don't have any helpful gut microbes to efficiently harvest energy from their food, they are leaner than their microbe-containing counterparts, despite eating more. When microbes ferment specific types of fiber, they can produce nutrients called short-chain fatty acids, like butyrate. This butyrate will then nourish the lining of the intestine. Other fermentation products can be absorbed into the body to be used as energy. Now, you may think that eliminating the microbiome would be a great way to lose weight, but it's pretty much impossible to live as a germ-free human. Studies in mice and men show that obese and lean individuals have different microbiomes. When a lean germ-free mouse is transplanted with the microbiome of an obese mouse through a fecal transplant, the mice become obese. In a human study, transferring the microbiome from lean donors to individuals with metabolic syndrome improved insulin sensitivity, an important factor in preventing type 2 diabetes. Generally, microbiomes from obese animals have less diversity with fewer different types of microbes. Exposing the immune system to diverse microbes helps teach the immune system what is friend and what is foe. The hygiene hypothesis suggests that reduced exposure to microbes misguides the immune system, increasing the development of allergies and autoimmune conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, type 1 diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis. Studies show an increased prevalence in allergies, asthma, and autoimmune conditions as populations transition from rural to urban settings and from developing to affluent countries. Exposure to fewer environmental microbes, along with increased usage of antibiotics, may drive a dysregulated immune system. The microbiome helps produce chemicals that allow neurons to talk to each other, called neurotransmitters. 
Even though the brain and the gut are anatomically far apart, they communicate with each other through the brain-gut axis. This axis is composed of the enteric system of neurons around the intestines and the vagus nerve, which serves as a highway to the brain. The microbiome regulates synthesis of the neurotransmitter serotonin. In the intestine, serotonin regulates gut motility, or the transit time of food through the GI tract. And in the brain, serotonin regulates mood and cognition. 90% of all the serotonin in the body is produced in the gut. The microbiome stimulates specific intestinal cells to produce serotonin, which can then act as a signaling chemical throughout the brain-gut axis. Even though we know that the microbiome is important for health, we still can't clearly define what a healthy microbiome is. There's so much variation between people that there probably isn't just one healthy microbiome, but rather a whole spectrum. But there are some evidence-based steps that we can take today to help support a healthy microbiome. Healthy microbiomes are diverse like a rainforest whereas unhealthy microbiomes are comparable to algal blooms. Greater diversity of species makes it less likely that just one pathogenic bug can take over, like antibiotic-resistant C. diff bacteria. You can support a diverse microbiome by eating a variety of fiber-rich foods, like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. This variety will nourish a wide range of microbes from all the different types of fiber. On the other hand, diets that are high in saturated fat and low in fruits and vegetables sustain a microbiome that is associated with weight gain and the production of metabolites that increase cancer risk. Antibiotic usage wipes out large swaths of the microbiome. While antibiotics are necessary to treat bacterial infections, they're completely ineffective for viral infections. So take the full course of antibiotics when they're prescribed for a bacterial infection, but don't run to antibiotics as a cure-all for everything. Your microbiome will thank you, and you'll help slow the development of antibiotic-resistant superbugs. There has been a lot of interest in directly consuming microbes through probiotic supplements or in fermented foods. While there's a lot of potential, the research is still really early in identifying which of these microbes actually make it down our GI tract, whether they stick around for any length of time, and whether these are even the right microbes to be eating for specific conditions. I'm keeping my finger on the pulse of this research. So support diversity in society and your microbiome. That's what science tastes like. Thanks for tuning in to Nourishable. Let me know in the comments below if you have any specific questions about nutrition in the microbiome, because I'd love to dedicate more videos to our microbial menagerie and use more poop emojis. Subscribe to Nourishable to stay up to date on all things nutrition.